Welcome back to Arcadia. Uh, when we left you in warm weather last was the fall uh, last year where we were uh, suffering through some uh, some hard lessons learned in our first season of farming. Uh, so this year is about trying to right those wrongs and then uh, we'll suffer through different things in our second year of farming. <laughs> it seem, seems to be the way of things, but uh, you know, we're, we're certainly making progress. Uh, we have a lot more roots in the ground. Uh, we have a lot more of the, the basics of our system established uh, and we're applying a lot of the lessons learned from last year. So hopefully this year we'll get full-sized chickens. Uh, and uh, what else did we screw up last year? Uh, well, we got frost in September mm, yeah. and that we had a lot of things like beans and um, things just stuff we were saving for seed still on the vines and then we got frosted so we kind of got cut short in our seed saving um, and preserving things for winter so um, but that's all about learning about where we live and what our climate is like and what to expect and, and what, so on so yeah, and frost has again been a been a theme uh, we had a, a pretty big setback so you know, our average last frost date is supposed to be May 10th uh, but we're at the bottom of a hill here and just sort of the lay of the land anytime it's around like under 10 degrees we're we're at risk of frost uh, but one of them came with no warning and then the next two nights so uh, that set back uh, uh, a lot of our stuff or killed a lot of our stuff uh, that we'd been uh, nurturing for several months uh, from from winter until uh, planting it in the ground and thought we had uh, ha had that one licked but nature uh, nature bats last so uh, this is just a quick update on uh, the things that are going on at the farm because there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, exciting to us things and hopefully exciting to you too and YouTube <laughs> and Kayla made us a farm sign it's actually hand painted. Looks pretty sweet, I think. Of course, I'm biased. And our little farm stand is plugging right along as we sort of sell out the last of spring and start moving into uh, towards summer. And we have a new farm sign. Let me take it. Nope, not yet. It's hard on my wrist that way. Home sweet home. I'm Kurt, I'm the beekeeper with Mike here at Arcadia. These are my hives and uh, due to such a wonderful area and all the things that Mike and Kayla do here, they, uh, the bees these bees right here decided that they were so good that they wanted to make a new hive and that's what a swarm is. So they swarmed from here before I came to do my inspection. They swarmed all the way up to the top where that ladder is over there. So Mike just watched me uh, butcher his tree to get some bees down. You guys can come in closer if you like. And so I took all those bees and I put them into this box. And you can tell that bees, when they're in a swarming state, they're not angry. You can be standing in front of them, you can touch them, you can brush them up onto your hands, and they, they just want to be with mama. 
And there's, that's what they're doing right here now is all these bees are fanning up. I can feel the breeze in my face and it's called the Nasanoff pheromone. And the Nasanoff pheromone is the, this is home, come home. There's a big invisible plume of Nasanoff around here right now. So all these bees that came out of the hive with their queen and that are flying over there, kind of confused, saying where did they go? They're gonna swim, they're gonna fly around here a whole bunch until they catch that plume, and then they're gonna come into the plume and they're gonna start moving into this box. Inside an hour, they're all gonna be in there. Give them a week to get settled in, and the queen will start laying eggs. I'll come by and I'll make a hive health inspection, and uh, and we have a whole new colony that's ready to go and make some more Arcadia honey. Everyone else is doing great. That uh, first, uh, the survivor, one of the survivor hives from Winter. They, uh, they're up to box number three for honey. They got two full starting to cap and getting work, uh, starting work on the third. This one here is doing the same. This one here looks like they were getting ready to do a little bit of swarm action, but I found the queen, marked her, and uh, got rid of the swarm cells. I want them building up and out, not not splitting, because Old beekeeper saying a swarm in May is worth a pile of hay, a swarm in June is worth a silver spoon, and a swarm in July ain't worth a fly. Because if you get a swarm in July, you won't get anything off of them for honey and not much out of pollination. They, uh, you gotta have to scrape them by and hopefully make them through winter. So it's at this point where you want to manage your colonies for disease, pest, and health. And part of that health is making sure that early in the year, if they're so strong, you split them. And then later in the year that you that you make sure that they're they're treated properly if they have any type of mites or uh, disease pests anything like that. But uh, all these girls are doing really good. I did mite counts on them last week and they are quite low. So I'll give them a uh, bit of a treatment in the fall and it's an all natural treatment. Uh, and yeah, it's uh, it's way too much fun for me. A lot of people don't like it though. So you're bouncing back after a uh, tough winter? Yeah, very tough winter. Uh, a lot of beekeepers lost a lot of hives. It was, uh, it, it, it was a difficult bee, uh, year for bees. A uh, little bit for weather, a little bit for, for pesticide use, a uh, little bit for uh, disease and mite pressure. So add all those things up together and you just have to try and do your best to, to raise the right genetics and, and put them in the right state. And uh, you learn something new every year. Beekeeper once said to me, if you, you learn something new every year for 40 years, and then you'll know everything you need to know about bees, and on the 41st year, they're going to do something completely different. <laughs> and so this is, this is our first swarm, our this first hive that swarmed. This is the first swarm. hot swarm, absolutely. I'm not sure if they uh, can't be here all the time, but, uh, yeah, the they, queen, uh, queen will lay a bunch of cells. Uh, and she agrees with it, she wants to, uh, and they start making, as soon as that, that new princess or virgin queen's going to hatch, about a week beforehand, the queen that's in here now slims down, so she can fly, because normally she's so fat, she's got a big old arse on her that she, she, she can't fly, so she'll stop eating, and then that way she takes off and she'll fly up, usually not that high, but sometimes that high, or out, and uh, she'll, uh, she'll land in the tree. And all of her, about a half uh, to two thirds of the workforce go with her. Only, uh, only strong, strong females, uh, foraging types. They fill their bellies with honey, and they're they're depositing honey in these cells down in here right now. And uh, they're they're getting ready to organize a nest for her. She's getting comfortable with the space, inspecting it for herself, and tell and basically saying, you know, organize it this way, and then she'll start laying eggs in there. And uh, they, they're already, I've already seen some pollen coming in, so uh, might have been just from what was coming out, but as soon as you see pollen coming in, they've really accepted it as a, uh, as a, as a home. And uh, yeah, just leave them, leave them be for a bit here. And, uh, oh yeah. So one of our hives that survived winter has swarmed and turned into two hives. Yeah. So we're starting to get some genetics, Arcadia yeah, genetics, genetics here, uh, well suited to the environment. Exactly. So this one over here, the queen, the virgin queen will go out at some day in the next week, get mated with uh, eight to 
15 or so drones. They die during the, the coupling process because their, their bits come off. And uh, then uh, the queen will come back and that's the only time she'll leave unless she swarms. Um, but that's, uh, that's the only time she leaves. And then she'll start laying up to 2,000 eggs a day. 21 days later, new bee. 41 days after that, uh, during the summer, is the lifespan of a bee. And they'll make one eighth of one teaspoon of honey in their entire life, one bee. Same drill with our laying flock uh, as for last year. You'll see some new faces in here. Uh, Kayla found us a couple of ready to lay hens, uh, where we also learned uh, the do's and don'ts of introducing a new chicken to a new flock. Uh, but still moving about every, uh, every five days or so. Uh, and they just got fed their supper, so they're super active in the evening. Uh, and then here, sort of latched on, uh, is our, oh, they're, they're kind of shy, a little black ocular layer chicks, uh, who will be the replacements for uh, any non-performers, non-hackers in, uh, in the flock going into their second winter. So we'll do a call in the fall. And these new girls uh, are going to spend the next two months uh, living in this little chicken tractor uh, until they're big enough to go in with the main flock because the main flock are, uh, they can be violent. <laughs> so out of the three new hens that we got, the ready to lay hens, we got two copper morans and one americuna. Um, and the copper morans lay a different colored egg, so it's a dark brown egg. This one has speckled, one of them lays speckled eggs, the other one just lays solid dark brown eggs. Um, and then this lighter brown egg is from one of our red sexlings from the original flock. Uh, and the Americuna uh, was, we thought was the bully out of the pack and, and turns out was getting bullied herself when we put her in with the Bane pack and, and she didn't do so well um, and ended up getting sick at some point. And, uh, we lost her, so we're we're down one chicken so far this year, and due to illness and one due to a fox. <laughs> this year, uh, we're doing 30 meat birds, two batches of 30. Last year, we did one batch of 25, uh, and we ended up with sm birds smaller than we wanted after eight weeks last year. Um, kind of a, a delicate balance uh, when you're raising them on pasture because they do get some nutrients from being on grass but not very much so I think we could have probably fed them more uh, chicken feed last year and relied less on grass and bugs and things like that um, so this year we are raising them on a 12 hours on 12 hours off regimen so uh, they get feed as much as they can eat from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then we take the feed away uh, overnight. Right now they're eating about 5 pounds of feed a day for 33 birds. I don't know what that uh, And so these birds are 3 weeks old and they're not quite all feathered out yet. So they're not ready to be out overnight on grass. But, so this is their first day in the tractor, but we will be moving them into the coop for nighttime as it gets cooler and bring them back out tomorrow and hopefully in the next couple days they'll be feathered out enough to spend all their time on pasture. The vegetable garden is, so the, the rabbit proof garden is, uh, is slowly coming along. Uh, we've got our uh, onions, uh, we've got our lettuces, our peas and our turnips uh, in there. We're still yet to plant carrots, but we've got some beets coming up. Uh, everything's sort of slow. We had a, uh, a pretty vicious three nights of, uh, of frost at the end of May, early June. Uh, so uh, most of our eggplant and peppers got killed by the frost. So this is part of the garden of death, um, some of which we were able to replace. Uh, so this is a replacement one from a, from a nursery. Uh, but this is a, an eggplant that's sort of springing back from the roots. So. Um, some of them are recovering, uh, some like this little uh, chili pepper here are taking a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, almost, we lost almost all of our jalapenos, haven't been able to replace them. Uh, so it was a uh, uh, kind of a rough start to the spring. Uh, but we've got like 
500 garlic. Uh, some of the tomatoes survived. Our corn is coming up over there. Uh, we've got our potatoes coming up. Uh, peas are doing really well. We've got strawberries. Uh, we've been getting a, like, a fair uh, number of strawberries every morning. So things are coming along. We're, uh, we're sort of learning how things like to grow and where things like to grow. Uh, and we definitely have a lot more food in here than we did this time last year. Alright, so I'm standing uh, <laughs> just uh, in our new garden beds that we added last year. Uh, there's a cat laying in your tomatoes. You may want to He's probably going to shit in it. Um, so we added all of these and we're now growing our tomatoes here and corn. Um, so to make these beds, we mulch, um, the area, cover the area with cardboard. Uh, put a layer of compost on top of the cardboard and then, you know, a six inch layer of wood chips on top of that. So we did that in the fall and then, you know, the bed sat all winter and got the spring thaw um, and we're ready to plant into uh, this spring. So this triangle here is corn and squash in the corners. Um, my squash got frosted so I've, I've direct seeded it hoping it'll come back. Uh, we have two rows of tomatoes, um, a row of garlic. And then the two beds at the very back um, behind the garlic are our potatoes. So uh, everything's doing fairly well, all things considered. Uh, potatoes are coming up. I've got some more squash alongside here. Sunflower. Um, and we're ready for our beans to come up or to oh, grow up. The permaculture orchard is coming along uh, in sort of drips and drabs. Uh, we've managed to uh, kill a few things, uh, but uh, we've also had some successes in here. Uh, so this year's focus, uh, you might remember last year, we were focused on getting trees in the ground. Uh, so this, uh, this little pear tree here, being one of them, uh, came through the winter really well, and now it's got a few caterpillars on it. Um, this year we're establishing the shrub and herb layer. So, uh, we've been putting a lot of stuff in, uh, little oregano starts, uh, thyme starts, we put in some daylilies, that's a comfrey, um, this is a goji berry, and um, then we've got, this is Turkish rocket, which is like a perennial broccoli almost, um, and that's a skirret, which is like a perennial parsnip, we've got some gooseberries, uh, with the idea being that the trees are going to grow up over top. Uh, and the shrubs are going to fill out underneath and then the herb layer is going to fill out uh, underneath that so we'll get multiple layers of food. Uh, the big challenge we've had in the orchard this year is the gypsy moth caterpillar. This is a big year for the gypsy moth caterpillar. So uh, they ate all the fruit that was setting on our blueberries, they ate all the fruit that was setting on our sour cherries, and they've pretty much eaten all of our apple trees. As you can see our polar red which was uh, covered in, uh, in beautiful flowers in the spring, uh, is now covered in almost adult uh, gypsy moth caterpillars. Uh, so we're going to, uh, we've ma made a note to start uh, picking the, uh, we know what the, their egg masses look like that they leave over winter, uh, so we're going to scrape those and, uh, and flush them wherever we can find them. Uh, and hopefully next year reduce the pressure on the, uh, on the poor apple trees. So I'm standing next to the ants garden right now, um, which was one of the existing gardens here that Mike's ants helped me uh, revive. Uh, so last, the first year we were here, we just plugged all these plants that were given to us in various places without really knowing what was here. Uh, and last fall, I was finally able to move things around to where I wanted to. Um, and it's, it's really coming together, looking a lot better. Um, so we had irises, uh, that are just poppies and irises, they're about finished now. Um, the bridal wreath, which is this, I think it's bridal wreath, is just coming into flower. Um, we have four o'clock and bee balm that will be flowering soon ish. Um, and I installed this pathway uh, between our vegetable garden and the ants' garden to kind of minimize the amount of lawn that we have to mow. Speaking of lawn, uh, last year, when you saw us last, this was uh, just lawn, and uh, when uh, Scott let me uh, haul a bunch of logs uh, that the beavers had uh, knocked down, a bunch of poplar, uh, we chopped them up and brought them up here to 
edge all these gardens because everything's on a, on a pretty steep slope. And we're slowly establishing these into, uh, into perennial garden beds. Uh, so these are, these are my gardens and uh, they'll be a little bit more chaotic than, uh, than Kayla's because I'm of the school of thought of I'm going to jam as much stuff in there as possible and uh, cover the ground uh, and then sort of move stuff around later. Uh, so you know, there's, there's some kind of design to it, but uh, you know, it's, uh, with any garden, it's a, it's a work in progress. We also planted a maple tree to commemorate the birth of our first son. Uh, and, you know, it's something we plan on doing if we are, are able to have more kids. Uh, we will uh, plant a tree for each of them to, and, you know, maybe for grandkids and that sort of stuff in the future. Uh, real nice legacy. This one is a uh, crimson maple tree. I think it's called a king crimson maple tree uh, with bright red foliage in the fall. Um, so hopefully the caterpillars don't chew it too much. Another lesson learned is that you can never have enough compost uh, from your farm. Um, so we had to buy in a couple of loads of compost in order to establish our new garden beds. Not something we're interested in continuing doing. So we are vacuuming up organic matter from wherever we can get it. We're getting veggie scraps and stuff from the neighbors. Uh, we have used chicken bedding. We just cleaned out brooder brocks there. That's our uh, our high test garden compost. So that's uh, you sort of controlled. Uh, only the good stuff goes in there with appropriate levels of uh, chicken bedding and uh, and veggie scraps. This is our low grade compost. It's just you know trimmings and branches and grass cuttings and sod blocks and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then here's just an old pile of sticks. Uh, that we pee on a bunch uh, and then we burn some of it down and we're going to turn that into a form of biochar uh, and these will be used for things like tree planting to give them a good head start and here's all that uh, that deep bedding from the chicken coop over the winter uh, which we layered in with uh, grass that we saw scythed down uh, and it's reduced in size by about half so it's about ready to turn uh, and this will eventually be uh, compost for the orchard. So that sound you can hear that's like rain, that's actually gypsy moth caterpillar feces falling from the canopy like rain as they absolutely mangle our woodlot. These trees, these poplars and birches are not dead, nor are the oaks in the background. Uh, they just look that way because the uh, caterpillars have just eaten them bare. Looks like fall, late fall out here. 